thank you so much for having me. I have to let you know that um, I took a year hiatus from LastCon, so I wasn't here last year, but wow, it's like so good to be back. I walked in, and I'm like, oh, it's like being around family. Um, and when you're sort of a unicorn in this space, it's nice to have this camaraderie. So welcome, ladies, come on in. All right, so um, today we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, digital security for nonprofits, and it's a wake-up call. I will give you a spoiler alert right now. This is um, my dissertation research that I'm presenting. But first, um, how many of you knew Becky Bass? Info mom, infosec mom. Becky uh, was my mentor and my friend. She was a pioneer in this space. She died suddenly in March. Um, it was pretty tragic. She came to my dissertation defense. She was the woman who really got me into this field, so I owe her a lot. So I've been dedicating all of my talks this year to her. Um, if anyone wants to know how to be a mentor, I try and channel my inner Becky base. Um, so I'm happy to give you some pearls of wisdom of how wonderful she was and what amazing mentor she was to me, and maybe you can pass that on to others. How many of you saw my talk from a couple of years ago? Anybody? I know AJ did. Okay, good. Oh, newbies in the room. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm a bit of an oddball. Um, I have an MBA in marketing. You know those marketing people and those business people that InfoSec folks like to run away from or that get in the way of doing great security? Yeah, I used to be one of those. But then I had a personal situation where I was a victim of cyber stalking uh, for about seven years by someone I worked with when I worked at Yahoo. Um, it was a really awful situation. He pretty much stalked me and everyone connected to me for the better part of seven years. So that experience in meeting Becky Bass and Dr. Jean Spafford um, led me to security. And it was thanks to them. Um, I actually met Becky Bass at an RSA conference where I had no business being, but I was there at a dinner and she said, you know, you should think about security. I'm like, I have an MBA in marketing. Nobody's going to want me. Um, and then I met Dr. Gene Spafford, and he said, well, we have at Purdue an interdisciplinary program in information security. Do you want to do it? And I'm like, yeah, I'm a single parent living in Boston, which is nowhere near Indiana, and I have an MBA in marketing, so you don't want me anyway. So just for fun, I applied. And go figure, four years later, I got an information security degree um, from Purdue, interdisciplinary. Yes, I did cryptography. I did network security. Um, when Martin Hellman spoke here a few years ago, do you guys remember when he keynoted? I punched him in the arm after his keynote because he said, this is easy. This stuff that we do is easy. I'm like, no, it's not. It makes me cry. Elliptic curves make me throw up. So I'm just going to leave it at that. But anyway, I'm pretty much a unicorn in this space. So I really sit in my head in both spaces. I sit on the business side. I sit on the information security side, OK? So it's funny, because I'll go to ShmooCon and other conferences. I dress like a business person. I think like a business person. But I'm a security person at heart, and my passion is in this space. I also worked for the TOR project. TOR was used as a weapon against me by my stalker, but I was director of communications for TOR for two years. So I've known that part of the security space, open source, as well as uh, communities. Again, I mentioned I got my PhD at Purdue. And today, I run the Open Information Security Foundation. We build Sericata. Does anyone know what Sericata is? Does anybody know Snort? OK, we are way better than Snort, <laughs> like 10 times better. And I'm glad it's getting recorded. Uh, Sericata is a true open source IDS IPS network monitoring engine. If you want to know more, let me know. And I have stickers. So Sericata rocks. Um, but I run the foundation that owns and manages Sericata. So as you can imagine, my frame in security is very different than most. Um, so I'm going to. I want you to know that because this is probably not going to be the typical talk that you're used to. 
So when um, I was challenged by my committee to come up with a dissertation topic, they said to me, you know, you have to do something that's different. You have to move the dial of research in some way. And for me, I really wanted to make a difference in the world. So, you know, I started my PhD at 44. I'm going to totally out myself because I'm going to be turning 50 next year. So I, I started my PhD at 44, too old to go back to school, but it was amazing. So I'm sitting there with my committee, and they're like, you have to do something different. So I thought back to when I wrote my application to go to Purdue, and I thought, oh, well, I wrote about, of course, being a victim of cyberstalking. That was my lane. And I realized at that point, A, it's still too close for me to write about. So I couldn't put myself in that space again. The second thing is, is that research in the security field really focuses a lot on how victims use technology, OK? If you look out there, there's a lot around how domestic violence victims use technology. There was a great talk yesterday around personal security devices, and I'm so excited about the stuff you talked about yesterday. Um, but there's a lot in that space. So what I decided to do is say, what about my experience failed? And for me, it was all the people I went to for help that failed me in my journey. And not because they were bad people, it was because they didn't know important things about cybersecurity and technology. So then I looked at what's out there. Well, we've got one point. Ooh, that's a cool ringtone. Who is that? Can we say hi to whoever that was? Because that was great. <laughs> no worries, no worries. We have. Um, there's 1.5 million US nonprofits in the United States. That's a lot of organizations of all different sizes. So I stepped in, I thought, OK, well, if you've got victims, say, of domestic violence, that are using technology every day, the first place that they're going to go to is a domestic violence organization, right, for help. So I thought, well, what are they doing about information security? Are they doing anything about security? Do they even know about it? So I stepped in and decided that I was going to do a gap analysis on the information security and nonprofits working with victims of violence. So I did it in two, chain, two lanes. And, I, and I, just a side note, I have to tell you, so I presented my proposal to my committee. Now, my committee, age-wise, pretty much my peers, but they clearly outranked me in every level. So I presented, the business Kelly presented this proposal to the committee like, I'm going to change the world. I'm going to do all this great stuff. And they're like, stop. They said, get the PhD, go save the world, not the reverse. So I had to take this great idea I had about how to look at nonprofits and really boil it down. So I decided I'm going to look at nonprofits working with victims of violence, specifically domestic violence and human trafficking organizations. And I wanted to do it from a couple of places. And I'll share that with you in a moment. But the big thing that I realized was that nonprofits are being targeted for the same types of intrusions as large companies. They're not immune to all the things that you guys talk to big companies about or small companies about, but yet we're forgetting about them because they're not sexy and they don't have a lot of money and it's hard to help them because there's lots of non-technical people working in that space. So what do we do about it? So some of the questions that came up in my mind was, what's the likelihood of an attack on a nonprofit? We would all say, pretty likely, right? Um, how will they know if they're being attacked? Many of them don't have the systems in place to even send out an alert. What's the potential impact was a big thing that was gnawing on my brain. And then who, at the end of the day, is going to help these organizations? So this, these were all the questions that were floating in my mind when I was starting to do this work thinking I really wanted to make a difference in the world. The biggest question for them, though, is who wants to attack us? By the way, how many of you have donated to a nonprofit? Everybody, right? Have you ever wondered where your money's going? Have you ever wondered if your identity is being kept secure in that environment, your credit card, all of that stuff? I mean, your stuff is connected with them, right? Did you ever think about maybe they may not know what they're doing with your information? I'm not suggesting you not donate, <laughs> but
But I want to sort of raise that awareness that we all participate with nonprofits all the time, and yet we never think about how are they going to be attacked. And for many of them, they say, nobody's going to want to attack me anyway. This is my mother's attitude. My mom's like, who cares about my stuff out on the internet? Nobody's going to care about attacking me. Right? And so even though her daughter was cyber stalked for seven years and she lived through that experience with me. So um, found this actually just recently, 63% of nonprofit organizations, about a million organizations, suffer a data breach within one year period covered by a 2016 survey. 63%. Not all of them even knew it. Most of them didn't even have controls in place. This was done just by a survey. So this is self-reporting, OK? Um, so there's some questions in that space. But again, it's still a number that we should pay attention to. So the goals of my research was to first document the gap between actual and ideal security in this vein of nonprofits. The second was to identify the gap um, between the different crisis organizations. Was there a difference? Because human trafficking organizations are very high profile usually, right? Because the attackers, the bad guys, are usually global, um, well organized, um, and usually have a lot of victims that they're dealing with. Domestic violence organizations are a bit more localized. Um, smaller organizations dealing one-on-one -on -one with victims. So I was curious to see if there was a difference there. I also wanted to look at the gap across the dimensions of the NIST cybersecurity framework, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment. And then the other thing I want to do, so this is the business side of me. I'm a Gemini, so I get to have two sides. The business side, Kelly, and the infosec side, Kelly, were combining. So the business side of me said, well, how can we really help these organizations if we don't know who they are? If we don't know the business characteristics, how can we identify security protocols to help them? Or even make recommendations, right? So what I did when I started this, this project, I looked at the ISO standards, the 27,000 standards. I looked at COBIT-5. Both of these sets of standards are really useful, primarily for auditors. How many of you have looked at those two standards? The language in there is really complicated. Would we all agree with that? Really thick technical controls, um, compliance, a lot of really difficult language. If I put those types of words into a survey for nonprofit organizations, they would have like lost their minds. So instead, I went to the NIST framework, the NIST cybersecurity framework. Now, I have to tell you, in 2015 was the last time I was at LastCon, and I was sitting in the green room with Wendy Nather and Josh Corman. And I've known them before, thanks to my connections with Becky and others. And I was telling them about, I'm so excited, I'm doing this research. Do you know Josh Corman? I love that man, but he's like, why are you using that crappy thing, the NIST cybersecurity framework? He's like, it's so watered down, it's not going to give you everything that you need, and blah, blah. I mean, just went off. And I said, because I have to use a framework that the people that I'm working with can wrap their minds around. And really, the NIST cybersecurity framework has legs to it. The best part about it is that it maps back to ISO. It maps back to um, COBIT. It maps back to 853 and 171. So I'm like, this is a great tool for average people to use. I'm using it, so bug off. Um, so it was all good, but it, it was a great example of being able to step in and say, defend why I chose these different tools. So I did, um, the easiest way to get to these organizations was doing an online survey. Um, the challenge was is that I was concerned about doing it and then reporting the results and outing them. Because imagine what you know, attackers might want to want if I said, oh, I've got these organizations in Boston, Massachusetts that are totally vulnerable. Here you go on a silver platter, go attack them. Right, so I wanted to make sure that there was some layer of anonymity. So I partnered with two national organizations, the National Network to End Domestic Violence and Demand Opposition. Both of these organizations have databases of um, organizations in their coalition. 
So it was easy. So I just worked with those two organizations. They sent my survey out. I sent 500 surveys out. Who would like to guess? How many of you have done research on any level? Guess how many I got back? Two hundred and twenty-two. So what does that say? They're interested. They want it. They need it. So part of this, too, was when I gave a talk at the National Network to End Domestic Violence about my story, more so than anything else. I stood up. I, I finished my talk, and I'm standing off to the side, and they put together a panel with Facebook, Twitter, Verizon, and somebody else I can't remember. And this is 500 domestic violence organizations in the room. And I'm standing off to the side, just sort of listening. And the people up on the stage and the panel were awesome. And they're like, we're doing all these new security features. And we're doing all this private browsing. And we've got all these great tools. And they were very excited and very well intended. Everyone in the audience was literally like this. Tell me. Tell me what we can do. And yet, the, the looks on their faces were like, we don't understand a word you're saying. The gap literally was right there in front of me. And I was like, OK, well, so they need it. They want it. It's the barrier around language. It's a barrier around that we're making it complicated. So when I got this back, and let me tell you, so Spaff, um, Gene Spaffer was my committee chair. And he's like, you know, Kelly, you're doing something new. Nobody's going to want to participate. You know, don't be sad if it doesn't work. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm fierce, and I'm going to go after this. He's like, it's all right. He's like, if you get 56 responses, you can move forward with your dissertation research. I'm like, just watch me. I'm just so I sat on Qualtrics every single day. Um, but when I got this, I was like, this is an important. Mark, this is an important thing to say. They really, really want this to happen. So we should help them. So I have a couple of examples from the results of the research. So I sent out the, um, I sent out the survey, the online survey, and it had my contact information in case anything went south. Because I'm like, oh, the link is going to die or something, right? So I got this from one of the domestic violence organizations. And she said, we really want to take the survey, but the link isn't working. So I immediately panic. I set up a whole new refresh of the link in Qualtrics. I'm like freaked out. So I said, so glad you're interested in taking the survey. Here's another link. Please let me know if you have any problems. And here was her response. So again, right? This is another data point to step in and say, these people are coming at security. They're coming at using technology from a very different space than we are. It doesn't mean that they're dumb. It just means they see the world differently. And so as a security professional, I felt like it was important to step in in their space to help them move things forward. Here's another example. We're looking at Google Analytics. They were getting hits from Bangladesh every single day. So their, their paradigm was, if we don't know something is happening, we don't have to report it or do anything about it. So we're just going to kind of sit on this. And these are also organizations that say to me, you know what, Kelly, I don't have time to think about stuff like this. We've got people who need beds to sleep in tonight. I can't worry about stuff like this, right? So all of this stuff was like this huge aha for me. Um, as, a, as another little side note, so the survey that I developed, I actually had a pilot group um, review it before it went out to the organizations. I had five industry experts from information security. Becky was one of them. Um, there are several other safe flight guys. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, then I had five uh, domestic violence and human trafficking experts on the other side. When they, they did three rounds of review on the survey, the conversations between those two groups were unbelievable. I was, I was going to ask you if you can guess which word in the survey um, stuck, uh, stuck in their minds the most, but I'll just tell you. Um, 
the nonprofits or the domestic violence folks said to us, um, what do you mean by inventory? Because the identify function in this cybersecurity framework, the first thing you do is inventory, right? And the security folks are like, what do you mean, what do you mean by inventory? Isn't it obvious? So there was this huge dialogue around one word, one basic word. I was like, wait. So we have to actually think about every single word that we're using to help these people get there. So anyway, it was another really interesting example. So here are some of the results. Who manages the computer information technology organization? 34% full-time employee with IT as part of their job. Part of their job. And IT doesn't mean security, right? Because how many of us know that some of the IT folks out there in the world don't understand security? Just a little bit. I'm not slamming anybody, but the silos still exist. Right? 25% information technology consultant. Uh, ooh, third party. Are you vetting them? Do you know what they're doing? Um, and then a third party vendor, but I would put this, the two in the uh, middle. But some of the open responses is nobody manages it. Staff who happen to be not, uh, knowledgeable, kind of, in IT, those are direct quotes from people filling out the surveys. So this isn't a surprise to us, but for them it was like, ooh, we don't even have anybody thinking about this. It's it's a it's faster and they think if they hand it off to somebody else that everything else will be done well. So another great example is Demand Abolition. It's a national organization, multi-million dollar organization to combat human trafficking. They were awesome as partners. But as we were meeting, I said to them, um, we were sort of having a great conversation. And they said, oh, Kelly, we're having a hackathon, because it's a sexy word. We're having a hackathon this weekend. And I said, ooh, I won't tell you what they did, because it's actually quite, well, it's a bit illegal. Um, it's, they did a mobile hackathon, um, but the point of it was, so I put the, the business hat on and I said, oh, cool, how are you marketing it? And they said, oh, on Facebook and Twitter and our website and did it and like, I'm like, oh, cool, security hat on. What are you doing to lock down your environment? And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, the bad guys read Twitter and Facebook and your website. They know that you're gearing up for this big community event to do things that are gonna try and get to them faster. Oh, maybe we should call the consultant that's handling our, our security and our IT to lock things down, or at least monitor. I said, just you know, take a moment in time and make sure that after the event, you kind of keep an eye on things because you never know what might happen. But they weren't even in that mindset. They also said to me, they're like, yeah, we had a DDoS attack a few months ago. I said, oh, well, what happened? We don't know. I said, what do you mean? Well, the consultant just said that it happened. I said, well, what did they do differently? What did they change about your protocols and your systems? And we don't know. OK. Are you good with that? We're good with that. I said, great. <laughs> so, um, no surprise that a lot of these organizations are using social media. My biggest question for many of the nonprofits that I talk to is why? Not how you're securing it. Because when, if you jump into a security conversation from the get-go, they're going to want to walk away from you, from you. So particularly when I'm talking to folks about social media, talking to nonprofits, and they want to talk about social media, I first want to say, well, why are you using it? What's the purpose for using Facebook? Is it outreach? Is it connection for victims? Is it you know, just because you think you should because everybody else is? How are you using it? What are you measuring? All of those business questions. Um, many of them didn't have answers. A lot of the organizations that I looked at prior to jumping into dissertation, it was amazing to me that they have um, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, and some of them were even using Snapchat. No, 
don't use Snapchat, please. If you're a domestic violence organization, don't use Snapchat. So anyway, this, was, this wasn't surprising, but still useful information. Does your organization consider itself prepared to handle a cybersecurity breach or attack? 51% don't know. Now, in full, in, uh, full honesty here, the survey needed to be um, designed in a way that was short enough for them to want to participate. So there were 42 questions in the survey. I used three of the five function of the NIST cybersecurity framework. So I tried to keep most of the research in the identify function, but I did throw in things like this, which are more from the um, recovery and response function of the uh, CSF. Just because I was curious, I wanted to know where their headspace was as much as what was real in the organizations. Another open response, our computers are so old, nobody seems to want to crash in. Okay. So the first thing that came to mind when things like the WannaCry attack came was, what if there was an organization, to be named in a moment, that could actually reach out to nonprofits knowing what their inventory is, knowing what their systems are, and say, hey, you might want to go upgrade this, or you might want to go fix this, and give them the path to do it instead of just saying, oh, you're screwed. Sorry, you're going to have to just deal with this. And by the way, don't read the media, because the media isn't always correct. Um, but that's sort of PTSD from my tour days. So. I won't go down that road. Anyway, so key findings. The nonprofit environment is different. So there is some synergies between small companies and nonprofits, but nonprofits extend from two person organization to multi hundred thousand person organizations, right? So there's lots of flavors around the nonprofit sector. But the environment is different because a lot of what they do is based on trust, okay? So the business has to be looked at very differently than other businesses. The who is managing technology in their environment is a big question, regardless of security. Just who's taking a look at what devices you're using? I talked to an advocate, someone who goes to meet with victims, and she said, I said to her, well, you have your, your phone with you. And she's like, yeah. And I said, so when you go meet with a victim of domestic violence, do you bring your phone with you? She said, absolutely. I said, do you turn off GPS locator on? She said, oh, how do I do that? Just like simple stuff. But if you were to ask some of these people about physical security, right, they are right on it. They know how to do this. So the concept of security, particularly with the domestic violence and human trafficking nonprofits, it's there. They know how to think that way. We just have to sort of make it easier for them. So I asked, do you want help? Um, many of them said we don't know where to go. 60% said we don't know where to go. There are many organizations out there, some of the biggest security folks out there have community engagement opportunities so that their people can go out and help other organizations. Um, there's also hackers, what they're called, Hack not hackers for hire, but they're like hackers for charity, thank you. Um, and other groups like that, which are amazing, but the, in my opinion, the fatal flaw with them is that they have all this great resource, but they don't know how to connect with the nonprofits, and frankly, they don't know what the nonprofits need to be able to give them the right help. Budget, of course, is always a barrier for small companies, particularly nonprofits, but it doesn't have to be, okay? Even though 70% said the budget was the biggest barrier, I don't buy it totally. Did they share any budgetary numbers with you? They did. So I have some demographics around the um, operating budgets of the organizations, and it ranged from $100,000 a year to over a million dollars a year. For security No, just, uh, just strict operating budgets. I did not ask any uh, specific numbers around security operating budgets because that felt like virgin. That would be a subset of that, which means they don't spend anything. Security. Likely. Likely. Um, the first question I would suggest to them would be, what, what do you spend on technology? And then, what do you spend on security from there? 
uh, knowledge about what is vulnerable. So again, it goes back to that identify. They don't understand the things that are of use in their organization. So the executive director who sat on my porch of my house saying to me, we're getting all these hits from Bangladesh, I said, I totally respect and honor that you have to fill, you have to fit the needs of the community as your primary mission. However, if your donor database gets compromised, what is that going to do to your organization? And then she stepped back and said, I never even thought about it. And we keep our donor database in a Google Doc. Not kidding. And is it a priority for them? It's getting to be, right? Think about in a domestic violence shelter, how many devices walk in with the victims? And these folks are, are asking this uh, organization to be their first line of protection and safety and a new life and all these important things and these folks aren't equipped to be able to even help those folks figure out what to do some of them hand them a pamphlet and say this is how you turn off the GPS locator just a pamphlet they're great people I'm not knocking them so please know this comes from a place of of wanting to help and the risk is real. General business functions, as I mentioned, just like any other business, outreach and communication channels. If somebody were to go south on their Facebook pages and call them, you know, if they went out onto uh, a Facebook page of a domestic violence organization and started damaging their reputation, that could uh, potentially close their doors. Privacy, imagine the level of privacy. Human trafficking victims are particularly at risk because many of them are coming in from international um, areas around the world. We also have a very large human trafficking problem here in the United States. Fundraising, again, the donor database, if that were compromised, is it going to give them com uh, confidence? If the organizations that you guys have given money to in the past were compromised, would you want to give them money again? At least, I'm sure for as security professionals, you might step back and go, I'm going to take a pause. Maybe not a no, but I think I'm going to take a pause. And that's going to be a different, that's going to be a game changer for a lot of these small organizations. And then digital documents. As documents are moving back and forth to the courts and lawyers, they're moving. So people in these spaces don't understand uh, data at rest and data in transit, right? Basic stuff for us, but it's very, very challenging for them. So again, a digital security breach, an environment that's built on trust, can impact more than just data or the services organized. Okay, and for smaller groups, it will shut their doors easily. So the big so what? Yes. Um, what about the fundraising platforms, the software? Did, did that? Do they ever defer to pay for use this fundraising SaaS platform, and that's all, all that security built in? Or some of them, um, so I did a bit of investigation around that for the preliminaries. Um, not all of them are using secure platforms. Many of them are relying just on PayPal. And that's it. Again, it's that mindset that if I give it off to this organization, because they have the little icons on their page, right, then we're okay. We don't have to worry about it. But then they're still capturing, many of them are still capturing information on their own. They're not just relying on PayPal. But there were several that were just like, just, you know, email us with your credit card and we'll take it from there. So the big so what? A security breach in a nonprofit organization is not a matter of if but when. And I know I'm preaching to the choir on this, but for them this is big news. So the advice is always to have a plan, right? Figure it out, make sure you know what's going on. But for many of these organizations, even stepping into that headspace is difficult. So they're also getting advice around, oh, get cybersecurity insurance. Um, I will admit I'm not a fan of cybersecurity insurance. I will also admit I'm not that knowledgeable about it. I read about it, I'm trying to understand it, I'm trying to like embrace it, but I'm not there yet. And for me, because of the space I like to work in, it feels, again, like another way for people to take their hands off the wheel. 
I want them to keep their hands on the wheel of security in their organizations. Because if they can do that, then they can be better equipped to help the people who they're helping around security issues, right? So it's like paying it forward, but we have to start with them first. We are making security very, very difficult for people. We, we're scary sometimes, right? People look at us, if you say hacker to a non-security person, what do they immediately think of? Huh? Attacker. Bad guy, bad woman, all dressed in black, but not in a skirt, hoodies, right? We, we were having a conversation in the green room about it the other day, too, about like, what's a hacker? And I'm like, when I say hacker, or when I'm giving talks to non-security folks, I say tinkerer. Because it's different than saying hacker. Hacker, again, going back to the media, um, and as director of communications for Tor, I had to defend this all the time, that a hacker does not mean something bad. But it's left out in our community that it is, okay? So we look like hackers, security people look like hackers, and what they get afraid of is what if somebody wants to attack me and what if that's a person who I'm entrusting to help me with my security. Another great um, thing I've been looking at is that the basic IC security could have prevented the WannaCry attack. These are the things that are being said out in the media, but what it reads is that let's not confuse basic with easy or trivial. This is not easy, right? This is ugly. And getting there is ugly. Just getting a PGP key is difficult. And yet this would be some security measures for some of the, um, particularly the human trafficking organizations, that I would want to teach them. I would want them to embrace this so that they could actually have secure communications. So I had a big idea, as you can imagine, because I'm like the Energizer Bunny. And I had to like do something with all of this because I couldn't just do this research and step back and say, all right, go sit on a shelf. By the way, it's kind of weird when a 350 page dissertation um, gets printed in a leather bound book. I was like, my name is on that. I'm gonna put that like right on the coffee table so everybody <laughs> can see it. Um, but I didn't want to leave it from there because I felt like, you know, Look, I didn't grow up in this space. I, I was happy being a marketing person. I was happy in my little space before being stalked. Um, but I feel like there's some reason why I'm here. And the reason needs to be to help these organizations. At least that's what I'm hoping. So my focus is always to help people understand the balance between technology, privacy, and people. And you can change those pieces to be other things, policies in people, processes in people, right? So there's lots of conversations around this, but to me, it's not just always having a conversation around let's install this particular feature to make the world secure, right? Is there 100% security out there in the world? No. Do organizations like these think that there is? Yeah, they think if they spend a lot of money on a product that comes in a box, that they'll be secure. And we know that's not the case because we have to weave all of these things together. So in my opinion, we need a new approach when we're talking to particularly this type of organization or even small businesses. But I wanted something designed for nonprofits. So I have a big idea. So it's three parts. The first thing is to create an assessment tool for nonprofit organizations designed in their language, but that has under the hood the NIST cybersecurity framework and NIST 8171 uh, and 853, right? Build under the hood all of those things, but write an assessment tool and deliver the assessment tool in a way that will engage these people. And sometimes that delivery means going and sitting next to somebody and saying, let's walk through it. Right? Because frankly, some people who filled out my survey um, by the Security Preparedness Index, which is what one of the things I created as part of dissertation, they uh, scored a perfect score. I'm going to call BS on that, right? But it made me step in and think, wait, maybe they didn't understand the questions. Maybe they're afraid to answer the questions properly. 
So if we sit next to them and help them, then maybe we'll get real answers. Um, so create a tool that's written in their language, that's grounded in security best practices and principles, but delivered in multiple ways so that people will want to engage with it. Idea number one. Idea number two is once they have the results of that survey, don't just walk away and leave it in their hands, but have a conversation around priorities, right? Because if these organizations are saying we have no budget, no resources, no time, even if they do the assessment, everything's gonna fall back where it was, right? So why not have a conversation and say, what's most important? This is what your assessment says. These are some opportunities for you to make some improvement. Let's pick one. Let's just do one and then let it rest, right? Or pick a list of priorities, but help them prioritize it. And then the third part of my idea is to actually build a community, community of security folks who actually want to help nonprofits, but in a way that's useful. So we would actually take those priorities and those results, help them understand where they can go for help, and then connect them with the people in the security field that understand the nonprofit world, because we would help them get there, and then they could actually do the work together. Imagine if you had a community of security folks that were knowledgeable about how to work with nonprofits who could have an hour conversation around what a VPN is and how that could help them. That would be awesome. And then the next time they do the assessment, then they're gonna be like, hey, I remember, I talked to AJ about the VPN and we know what that is. And oh my gosh, we can tell our people what that is. And oh my gosh, we can tell the victims that we serve what that is. How cool is that? So this is the first time I'm gonna put this out in the wild. It's a little scary. But this is a nonprofit that I'm building. I'm filling out the 1029-501c3 application. On the top of the application, it says it takes 89 hours to fill this out. Get ready. Yes, thank you, IRS. So I am dreaming and hoping that next year when I come back to LASCON, I hope, that I will be able to say that Sightline Security is up and running and we have a prototype assessment tool and we have organizations we work, we're working with. Because 65 out of the 222 gave me their emails and said, please come and help us. So we have companies to help right away. So that is me and my vision and that's it. A little bit early, sorry guys. <laughs>